Um, myself and your word, that we uh, express who you are and that it touches our hearts and we move for what you would want us to do. Help us to be that light in the world. And we thank you for this church at New Beginnings and the pastors here, Pastor Horse and Pastor Mike. We just thank you for um, us being able to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, that was wonderful. That was fun doing that. Thanks, Jen, for leading us. And I've really enjoyed doing that. And Mike, I am part of this church. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so this is my church. All right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And um, I'm so happy to see all of you. And I'm so happy to have my girls here. And my grandbaby is here from Michigan. And so it's a real treat to have them here. Thank you, Kaylee, for the water. I'm happy for all of you being here and that you'll come here to worship God and you're not having fear of all other things out there that we're gathering to worship. Because, you know, some place people I've met that had gone to church are not going to church, still have not gone to church. And so I'm thankful for all of you not having that fear and trusting God and that we need to keep coming to God because I don't know, is there a reason for this? But we need to keep serving God. And again, as Mike had mentioned about our gathering at the park, that was so encouraging last weekend. I hope all of you, most of you were there. And um, the worship, the preaching, the praying, everything was so encouraging. And it was encouraging, like Jen said, to have people at, outside the park here and come join. So you don't know what happened from there. There's, yeah, there was a gentleman that came on a bike. I remember seeing him towards the front. And um, I guess he suffered with um, alcohol. And he had been sober, I think, for six weeks, was it? And so when he was riding his bike, he was starting to get, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Tempted. He was getting tempted to go and get a drink. He'd been six weeks. And he heard us outside singing praise music and preaching. So he came and he listened and then I saw them all praying over him. So we're just, we invited them, Mike invited them to church and everything. So hopefully good things are happening, but we're so glad for that. And we just pray for Jim that he is staying sober. But that's the one thing to go public out there is that people usually don't walk through the walls of church if they don't go. But if they hear you, they're curious, like what's going on? So that's what was happening. It was a beautiful day. Amen. And it was, it was so inspiring. I mean, everything was perfect. So it was definitely God-led. We just thank you so much for kind of getting that going. Well, as you see with that weekend and everything going on in our country, we, we need revival, right? And, uh, but for revival, it's got to start with ourselves first. So that's what my message is, to be looking at ourselves what we need to do to make that change. Because we can certainly say, well, that group or this or what. But in order for revival, it's got to happen with us. And some words were coming to my mind that God had, had been planting in me for um, some time here, especially lately this last week. Songs or whatever it is, and it kept being the word righteousness and holy. And so um, that's what we're going to talk about. Because in order for us to change inside, we got to have that righteousness. They talk about um, that Jesus had to be like him. So a small definition. What does it mean to be holy? It simply means for you to be dedicated to God. You are holy to the extent that your life is devoted to him and your actions reflect his character. Holiness is wholeness. They're closely related and God wants the whole of your life. So if you can remember that, holiness is wholeness. He wants all of you. If you can try to think of that, if you want to be holy, God wants all of you. Being holy is a lifelong process. It doesn't just happen. It's a lifelong process. Don't beat yourself up. Um, it is a process for me. That is for sure. My girls can testify to that. It is a process of looking and acting less and less like the things of this world and acting more like Jesus. So God wants us to live for him and do his will and act like him in all situations. So we're going to be looking at the book of Leviticus. If you've ever read this book, huh? 
So Leviticus is a book that concentrates on holiness. The holiness of God and the need for God's people to be holy. The book of Leviticus was the first book studied by Jewish children. The first book they would study this. Now for us as Christians, it's like the last one that we're going to read. And is it because of the law? But this law is talking about diet, sacrifice, and social behavior. But within these highly detailed directives, we discover the holiness, the separateness, distinction, and utter, utter otherness. And we learn how sin devastates humanity's relationship with our Creator and with each other. So we're going to look at some sacrificing. There's, uh, they cover different things in here. But we're going to look at sacrificing. So God established the sacrificial system so that his covenant people might enjoy his fellowship through worship and repentance and renewal. God set up with Moses five major offerings. There was a burnt offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. And you had to do something on each one of those things, okay? Didn't just say something. You had to do something. And it was major. So let's look at Leviticus chapter 4, verse 27 to 29. Okay. If any one of the general public does wrong inadvertently by violating one of Lord's prohibitions and thus is guilty... Upon learning of the wrong committed, that person shall bring an unblemished she-goat as the offering for the wrong committed. The wrongdoer shall lay a hand on the head of the purification offering. Lay your head, hand on the head of the animal that's going to be sacrificed. Every animal they sacrificed, they were to place, this was the direction they had to do, place their hand on the head of the animal. Now, there is meaning in this. It's a symbolic transferring of your sin to this animal, the victim. Your sin is now on this animal. God then takes this legal transfer of guilt from the animal, and he accepts that as a ransom payment for that sin. Let's look at Leviticus 20.10. There's all kinds of things. We won't go all over all the things, but you will get an idea of what you had to do. Listen to this one in relationships. If a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. Wow. That's serious. So God is saying this is serious. And what do we have out in our culture? Well, I'm just not happy. I'm just, you know, I want to be with this person. And, and so here we have the seriousness. God is still the same today. But he did change the law. But think about the seriousness of our relationships with each other. Because when this happens, this breaks the family structure down. It breaks our culture down. It breaks everything down. And we're not able to do God's work and be that light. That's why God said this was serious, all these things of sin. Now let's look at Leviticus 19. Actually, I'm not, I guess i got to find where I'm at here. Um, I want to say some more about that. We can go to Leviticus 19 and be ready, okay? Um. So basically, we could appreciate what God wanted the Israelites to do. If you had to pick your best animal, no blemish, you had to pick the best one, not the worst, because you had committed a sin. And, you, and, and the priests had to do that too if they committed a sin. You had to pick that animal, place your hand on the sacrificed animal. And um, Moses, God spoke to Moses, God spoke to the prophets, and the laws were passed down um, because they were having a hard time following God. 
the Israelites were living in Egypt for 400 years. So there was a lot of pagan worshiping going on. <clears throat> so here they're being corrupted with pagan worshiping, and now they're trying, the prophets are trying to guide them along and get their eyes focused on God and to be worshiping God. But the minute they, you know, Moses would back away and do something, they would be back to that pagan worshiping. And every time they had to bring them back and bring them back. And so this was so important to help change them from that pagan worship to get them to worship God and to see the seriousness of sin. So that was 400 years in Egypt. Now they're trying to change their mindset. Think about our culture. We've had some years of being away from God. So think about how hard this is to get people to get their minds back to God. That's why we need a revival. That's why we need change. In order to have change, we have to change. We have to be different. We have to change this now. It's not just coming to church and whatever. We have to be a, a light out there and take this seriously because we have been corrupted for hundreds of years. So here we go. Here's another example in Leviticus 19, 1 through 4. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the whole Israelite community and tell them, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you revere your mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. I, the Lord, am your God. Do not turn aside to idols nor make molten gods for yourselves. I, the Lord, am your God. Now let's look at verse 9. Through 18. So Moses is now speaking the Ten Commandments again. It's in a different way. We did it in Exodus. Now we're Leviticus. He's basically speaking the Ten Commandments here. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not be so thorough that you reap the field to its very edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. Likewise, you shall not pick your vineyard bare, nor gather up the grapes that have fallen. These things you shall leave for the poor and the alien. I, the Lord, am your God. If you know the book of Ruth, we study that in the ladies' Bible study, the book of Ruth. That is how she met Boaz. She, she was an alien. She came from a different country. And so um, people that were alien or poor, they were to leave food for the people outside of the country or poor to gather up. So there's a commandment to take care of the poor. You shall not steal. You shall not deceive or speak falsely to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, thus profaning profaning the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not exploit your neighbor. You shall not commit robbery. You shall not withhold overnight the wages of your labor. You shall not insult the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall not act dishonestly in rendering judgment. Show neither impartiality to the weak nor difference to the mighty, but judge your neighbor justly. You shall not go about spreading slander among your peoples, nor shall you stand by idly when your neighbor's life is at stake. I am the Lord. You shall not hate any of your kindred in your heart. Reprove your neighbor openly so that you do not incur sin because of that person. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against your own people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Where'd you hear some of that before? Didn't Jesus talk about that? You see, he was speaking from these Old Testament passages and bringing that. We'll look at that some more. But here... Um, here we have God's commandments spoken out again. He is speaking this out again. It's serious. Change your hearts. Change your minds. So have you ever had um, anything, like anyone, like a, a child or a friend or a spouse that is the relationship is hurt. Nobody's talking, or or something happened in there. Well, can you imagine? This is what I think of God. Like if you've ever experienced that, how painful that is. God experiences that with us. 
He hurts for us. He wants that relationship. He wants us to be holy as he is holy, as he said here in that verse um, uh, by one through four. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. If we are holy, that means we're putting God center. It's the only way. I can't follow my ways. I have to follow God's way. And when God is center then our relationships can be healthy. So we can check ourselves in that. Now, um, so we're going to be coming up to about Jesus. So Jesus is about 1,300, 1,400 years later from Moses in the book of Leviticus here. And as you know, Jesus is our ultimate sacrificial lamb. He offered himself up a perfect sacrifice on our behalf, taking the punishment that we deserved so that we might be forgiven. So let's look at Mark 15. And we're going to see righteousness here. We're going to see how righteousness acts, and he's mocked and humiliated. So in Mark 1 through 5, 15, Mark 15, 1 through 5. As soon as morning came, the chief priest with the elders and the scribes, that is, the whole Sanhedrin, held a council, They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king? King of the Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priest accused him of many things. Again, Pilate questioned him, Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of? Jesus gave him no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Okay, something, if you, when you're reading this, what's really unusual is um, if you were a king, would they question you like that? They're saying, are you the king of the Jews? You know, come on, say something. Is that how we treat a king? Is that how they would treat a king if there really was, if, if, if they thought? So they were mocking him. That's not how we treat a king. You see all these ironies here. That is not how we would treat a king, questioning him like that. Let's continue on how they treat him. Now on the occasion of the feast, he used to release to them one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again, Crucify him! Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? They only shouted louder, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them. And after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. So we see Pilate, he is the person that ultimately has the say what is to happen. But he didn't want to take that. He kept asking the crowd, what do you want to do? He didn't want to take responsibility for this. He did see that he was an innocent man, but he didn't want to stand up to the priests and all of that. He wanted the crowd to answer. And so what do they do? They decide to let a man go that murdered, and he was a rebel to the Romans. And they're going all along with this. I mean, anytime you're a rebel against Romans, that's why they were going to hang him. But they chose him to be free over Jesus because he said, I'm the king of the Jews. So 
here we have this happening, and they choose an innocent man to be hung on a cross instead of someone who murdered. It's crazy when you think about that. This is not only can that happen then, that happens today. We can treat innocent people or whatever wrong and stay the course as Jesus did. He hung on to God. Now, he was sent to be scourged. And um, I want to show you a picture of that. Not what that looks, but this is what they used. Just gives you an idea. So this is um, the whips they used, and they called them thongs, and they would have broken pieces of glass, stone, metal, and so every time when they whipped it, it would catch his skin and rip his skin. The maximum times that you could whip, scourge, flog a man is 40 times, but they would only usually go to 39 because if they miscounted, the flogger may get flogged himself. They had strict rules on that. The maximum you could go was 40. So it was usually 39 times. Jesus got the maximum 30 times. So as we continue reading, he's, you know, barely surviving. When you do that, you're, you're barely surviving that. And... Um, it's um, horrific, the pain. I can't even imagine. If you've ever seen Passion, what is the... Yeah, that gives you an idea. It's hard to watch. So let's continue on. Um, after they had flogged him, they continue in their abuse to our Savior. So in verse 16 through 20, the soldiers laid him away led him away inside the palace, that is the praetorium, that is the governor's headquarters, and assembled the whole cohort, that is the battalion of about 600 soldiers. They clothed him in purple, and weaving a crown of thorns, placed it on him. They began to salute him with, Hail, King of the Jews, and kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him. They knelt before him in homage. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. So again, we see them still abusing him. They have this, instead of a beautiful because they're calling him a king, he's having a beautiful gold crown. They have this thorny, long thorns on his head, and then they're hitting him with a reed. So you can imagine they're hitting probably those thorns going further into his head. He's bleeding. He's already in excruciating pain. They had put purple on him. Purple was what? A sign of royalty. So here they're mocking him again. You wouldn't treat royalty that way. Why, you know, they're putting this purple on him. So all this mocking, and they're saluting him, hail king of the Jews, all of this, mocking and mocking and mocking. And they spit on him. All of these things um, that I can't imagine have happened to myself. And yet, my sin... Our sin, we placed our hands on him. Our hands were on him when he was crucified. We put those nails on him. That was our sin. He was the ultimate, ultimate sacrifice that carried our sins. We can't forget that. We can't forget who we are and who we're not and whose we are and what he did for us. Remember, our hands were on him. He took our sins upon himself. He died a painful death for us and transferred our sins to him so that we could be right with God as the Israelites did with the unblemished 
animal. There was a reason for that. God wanted them to do that. So they understood what they had done. Don't you think your hearts would be changed if you had committed a sin and you had to take the best of the best and kill that animal? It's all about repentance. It's all about changing your heart. It's all about changing your mind. This is Christianity. Repentance. We don't have to feel bad about this. We need to do. This is what God was placing all along. Repent. Renew. Bring your eyes back to me. And Jesus comes, and he's doing the same thing. He is following God. He is following what God wanted. He is the ultimate sacrifice. He is the ultimate righteous and holy one. And we put him on the stake. We put him there. We are not that good. We keep wanting to tell ourselves we're so good. Yes, we have the righteousness of God in us, but just remember, we also have sin, and that's why we need a Savior. That's why we meet. It's not to be, I'm so good. It's because I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus. We need Jesus. Let's go to Isaiah 53. We're going to start reading 3 through 10. And Isaiah, the prophet, he spoke this about five, 600 years before Jesus came. But when he writes it, it's just like what Jesus went through. The prophet spoke of our Messiah. Listen, he was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, knowing pain, like one from whom you turn your face, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our pain that he bore, our sufferings he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, all following our own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though the harshly treated, through, though the harshly treated, he had submitted and did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter or sheep silent before shears. He did not open his mouth. Seized and condemned, he was taken away. Who would have thought any more of his destiny? For he was cut off from the land of the living, struck for the sins of his people. He was given a grave among the wicked, a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor was there deceit found in his mouth, but it was the Lord's will to crush him with pain, making his life as a reparation offering. He shall see his offspring, shall lengthen his day, days, and the Lord's will shall be accomplished through him. That is what righteousness is. Doing the Lord's will, no matter what. That is righteousness. Can we say that? Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. If we're supposed to be following God and be righteous, it's a lot. And a lot, think about this with righteousness. There are people that think, it's kind of hard to know what righteousness is, that you can put a bomb on yourself and become a suicide bomber where you're going to kill others because you're not their religion. And they believe they're going to the best place in heaven. So you see, we have to be careful who we follow. We don't follow the God of Muslim. We don't follow Buddha. We don't follow, you know, Muhammad and all this. We follow God, Yahweh, Jesus. Then we know what the right thing to do is, right? If we follow, I can't believe people think that's the right thing. I'm going to go put a bomb on me and just go and kill a bunch of people. We have to be careful. You see how they are corrupted? There's corruption going on. Just as the Israelites had pagan gods, we have pagan gods here. 
And so here we are as Christians needing to try to tell someone, hey, you need God. I don't need God. Sin. What? I don't have sin. This is crazy. How are we going to do this, Mike? (laughs) Pastor Horst? We have to, and all of you, how are we going to communicate that they need a Savior? Well, they don't even think they sin. Aren't we in a crazy world? we got to communicate this somehow for there to be revival. That we sin, and we need a Savior. So, in Mark 30, Jesus... Some more about this, about being righteous that we can place upon ourselves. Is in Mark 12, 30, you shall love the Lord your God and with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the second, Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So here we are. Jesus is speaking of these commandments all in two. All of those that all they talked about in these two. Why is that? Because if you love God, you're not going to have other gods, right? You're going to, the Yahweh, the one, true God. You won't have other pagan gods to worship. If you love your neighbor, are you going to steal from them? Are you going to covet their neighbor? You're going to, you know, um, kill someone, slander someone. All of these commandments are all put in there. Jesus said those two. We got to follow those. That's what they are. If we are his child, he wants us to reflect his character. That's it right there. We can kind of look at, sometimes we have to, how do we, um, how do you want to say, uh, be able to not judge, but just be able to tell, are, am, I, am I loving? There's some verses in there we can look at. John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. So whose team are you on? <clears throat> are you on the team? <clears throat> Excuse me. Think about that a minute. <clears throat> I needed a drink and I've been holding it. <clears throat> Goodness gracious. Well, think about that for a minute. Whose team are you on? <clears throat> are you on the team to destroy steal, have division? Are you on the team that's going to give abundant life? What does that look like? You can compare that in how we treat each other and what we're doing. And giving life, are we giving joy? Are we giving peace? All these things, are we producing fruit? That is the way we can test ourselves, because we have to test ourselves, because love can be kind of vague, right? We can kind of come up with our own thing. Well, you better love me this way. You know? It can be vague. We've got to think about what we need to do. So let's turn to Galatians 5.22. All right. Galatians 5.22. I really should have that memorized. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Wanting to attack my voice or something here? It's a fire. Come on. Uh, Woo! All righty. Voice don't go away. Keep keep coming. All right, 522. All right, here we go. Um, Okay, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. All right, now, um, I I wanted to read. That is what we need to do. We need to follow about um, loving, having joy, peace, patience, Kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, (sighs) self-control. Can I do that on my own? Oh my gosh, I think I fail every day. We have to do those things. And I think this verse needs to just be put somewhere in your house to remember and the commandment that Jesus gave to love God 
and to love your neighbor. And these are the things that we are to do to test our fruit. Let's read some before that. Paul is speaking to the church in Galatian. So um, there were some issues there, and he's addressing some of these issues. So there was freedom. He's, he's saying there's freedom in Christ, but it doesn't allow you to just do whatever. So this is what he's addressing on the do whatever here. For you were called for freedom, brothers and sisters, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. By the way, thank you, Jen. Sorry. For the law is fulfilled in one statement, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here it is, spoken again. Now Paul spoke, speaking about it. It just doesn't stop. But if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh has desires against the Spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, liciousness, idolatry, or liciousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, and occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty serious. Just as the Old Testament had the laws, that was serious. So if I'm doing any of these things, I'm not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I need to repent. I need to get things right before God. I can do this every day, maybe. We can do this every day. In contrast, we're going to read this again. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Whew. I can only do that if I have the Holy Spirit because I fail at it all the time. I need the grace of God. But you know, if we're aware of this and we're in God's word, we gotta be in, this is why we got to be in God's word every day. So we know how we need to live. So we know who God is and how he wants us to be because he loves us. Just as we love our own children, we don't want our children to be mean and bratty, right? It's not a good relationship. The same with our Heavenly Father. He wants a good relationship with us. So he wants us to be holy as he is holy. And we can only do that through the Holy Spirit, through God's word. Don't skip out on that thinking, I don't need that. I got No, you don't because we forget because we have sin in us. We have our selfish desires, and the spirit and the flesh are fighting against each other. So we have to stop and look and see what we're doing and take a turn. It's okay. We mess up. I mess up. I mess up all the time. Ask my girls. I mess up all the time. I have to ask forgiveness. I'm sorry. And, um, but that's what we got to do. We got to say, I'm sorry. Can we say that word, I'm sorry? Why is that so hard to say when we mess up? I'm sorry. Yeah. And you know, it's just our pride that we don't want to say it. And I'm right, you're wrong. I'm telling you, we all have that in us. <clears throat> but let's try to, and that commandment that Jesus gave, gave to love God, God spoke about it to Moses. He gave this instruction to all the prophets. It's all through the Bible. Bring them back to me. Repent. And Jesus then comes as our sacrificial lamb that we put our hands on. And we put him up there because of our sin. 
Don't think you're any better than anybody else, because you're not. You're not. We all sin. And we got to go to God and repent. And it's okay. It's not condemnation, because remember in Romans, you know, in Christ, it's not in condemnation. We, we have um, his grace, so we're not condemned. <clears throat> but we do want to turn our ways and keep turning our ways to God. Keep turning your ways to God. Keep turning your ways. If I mess up today, I have tomorrow. Keep turning your ways to God. And hopefully, by the end of the week, maybe you're a different person than what you were last week. Don't condemn yourself. Just keep turning and changing and looking to God and his love and grace. He wants you to be righteous. He wants you to be holy and whole. All right? All right, so now um, we need to pray. And after um, we're done praying, I, um, I brought my oil today, as we did the last time. If anybody is wanting to have prayer up front, please come up front, and we'll pray over you. I wanted to let you know that you have that opportunity. You don't have to, but if you want to, I'll be here, and Mike will help me with that. So <clears throat> let's go to the throne of God special place where the king of kings is sitting. He is the king of kings. Don't forget that. You saw how they treated and mocked him. He is the king of kings. And we're going to treat him that way, and we're going to give him honor. And so when we go to that place in prayer, let's talk to him as a king and honor. And don't treat him like that, but you honor him for what he did for our sins. All right, will you bow your heads, please, with me? Lord God, Lord God, you brought your son to us. He is the king of kings, and we thank you for what you suffered through giving your son to us to be the last sacrificial lamb for our sins. It is hard for us to comprehend this kind of love. But we know that you love us, and it's written throughout in your word how much you love us. You want us to be holy like you are. You want us to have a relationship with you. You want us to live for you because you know that it's the right way. We want to have peace. We want to have joy. We want to be patient. Then we're more like you. Help us, Lord. Help bring your Holy Spirit into us. Help us to be more like you. Help us to read your word every day. Help us, Lord. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for sinning against you or anyone. Lord, please help us to be more like you. It is so hard in this world how crazy it is. We see Jesus, though, what he dealt with. We saw what he went through. He was mocked. Help us, Lord, to be like, like him. Help us, Jesus, to be like you. We repent. We repent of all of our sins. We give it to you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for loving us for who we are. Thank you for loving us. Help us, Lord. Help us to bring revival. Help it to start in our hearts and our minds first. Help us to change, Lord, every day. Every day, turning towards you. Every day, loving you, loving our neighbor. Every day. Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. In your name, we love you. Amen. All right. Thank you so much.